So why don't we go ahead and get started? There's a, an AV issue here where they're going to change out some um, tech for us, and the slides will come up, but we uh, don't need them to get started. Um, it's a pleasure to welcome you all this afternoon. I'm going to introduce our panel and myself. This is uh, Dr. Demetrius Papanagnu. He's the Vice Chair of Education at Do Thomas Jefferson School of Medicine. Dr. Ann Messman, the Vice Chair of Education at Wayne State University. And Dr. Linda Regan, the Vice Chair of Education at Johns Hopkins University. I'm Mike Chizandi, the Vice Chair of Education at Stanford. And this is a panel about Vice Chairs of Education. So <laughs> folks have a lot of different titles up here. I'm not going to belabor those because we really are focusing uh, our discussion on this fairly new role in um, academic uh, medicine, really, not just academic emergency <clears throat> medicine. And our goal for this uh, session is to define two things. One, the path to vice chair of education. How do folks become a vice chair of education? For those in the room who are thinking about this as a potential career path within medical education, we're going to give you some data as to where the vice chair is currently uh, in the role, uh, where they've come from, and what path, be it UME, GME, or other. Uh, and then we're going to talk about what, what we do, what are, what are our roles and responsibilities um, in, the, in the role, and how are we trying to professionalize the role, if you will, so that we can all have a uniform approach to how we're supporting our departments. So that's our goal today. We have no pertinent disclosures. There are some CME objectives that you'll be very happy to not see right now that talk about uh, what I just said, defining roles and responsibilities uh, and pathways. So the format for our session today is twofold. We're going to have probably a 10 to 12 minute introduction of me offering some general uh, information uh, about this role. And then we're going to have our panelists dropping knowledge bombs for the rest of the time and answering your questions uh, for the remainder of the hour. Um, our uh, introduction is based uh, off of a National Vice Chair of Education Survey in Emergency Medicine that was conducted last year. Um, by our panelists, myself, and a couple of our colleagues who are in the audience, Jeremy Branzetti from New York University, Laura Hobson from University of Michigan, and Tony Zhang from Jefferson Medical College, uh, and Sherry Hopgood from Indiana University. So as a um, uh, collaborator group, we conducted a survey that started last summer with uh, a several-month exploration as to where the academic departments uh, in emergency medicine were, be it at university-based or county-based, public hospital-based um, departments in the country. And then we phone called and emailed every single one of them trying to figure out how many vice chairs of education exist. And that would be an N for a survey that we would then um, send out in the fall. And I'll tell you, this was a very tedious process. It took us almost 10 weeks to figure out just where the departments were and which departments had vice chairs and what kind of vice chairs they had. And we learned all about all different types of vice chairs. So you know, as you're thinking about some of the data I'm talking about, there's a vice chair of education opposite vice chairs that are executive vice chairs, vice chairs of research, vice chairs of faculty affairs, academic affairs, strategy and innovation. Uh, there's a lot of different titles uh, for folks out there that are uh, just under the senior leadership in the department. Um, and we had to suss out who's really a vice chair of education. Are they doing the work, but they don't have the title? Are they an associate chair? Could county use this chair of education to mean vice chair? There's a lot of um, nuance to this, and it took us a while to suss all that out. But I'll tell you that in the end, we identified 59 individuals who we felt held this role or a title that looked just like this role. Um, and that was a study period uh, that represented an end for a study period of survey time between August and November. So as of the end of November, we knew that there were 59. Now I look in the audience and I see a couple of new vice chairs that have been appointed since then. I know of at least five around the country that have been appointed. So this is a role that's gaining steam. And even in this last uh, nine months, we've seen a number of institutions add the role. So uh, it's, it's definitely on the rise, and we have to understand it a little bit better. Our response rate in our survey was quite good. It was 79.6%, so 47 of our 59 vice chairs participated in our survey. And um, you know, I have a, a nice table one to show you, um, which if you can imagine um, the Trump, uh, what was that? What do you need to, yeah, oh good, you're not gonna have to imagine. It's gonna appear from the screen. This is like the chief resident at conference when I speak. I can never make the videos play. So then they have to come up and they have to, and I used to be a chief resident. I could make the videos play one time, but as soon as my chief resident, you're ended, gone. I have no <laughs> idea how the videos play, so I'm very happy for that. So our table one, uh, about our 47 respondents, uh, you can imagine um, 
Uh, Bush's, uh, uh, Trump's cabinet, it's all old white men. That is, that is the large majority of the vice chairs of education. They are mostly male and mostly white. So 75% are male and 89% are white. And it's a relatively new role. Let's see if that'll pop up there. Um, uh, in our specialty, it's been around a little bit longer in medicine and surgery, actually, perhaps maybe 10 years. They've done similar studies in medicine, surgery, and radiology that have been published in various journals. But for us, it's fairly new. Uh, and it's new by a couple of markers. So it's an inaugural role at 75% of the places that have a vice chair of education. So the vice chair is, is the inaugural vice chair. I'm an inaugural vice chair. Time in role for our respondents on average was 3.5 years. So the vast majority of us less than five years. That's my table one, by the way. I like that picture. All right, uh, 3.5 years. And um, very few were recruited from outside their institution. So if you think about some of the other vice chair roles, particularly vice chair of research, there are a lot of vice chair of research openings around the country that are um, uh, competitive uh, searches right now. Vice chair of education is not that. Vice chair of education tends to be an internal promotion um, and very few folks are brought in from the outside. So 90% of folks are, are from internal hires. Um, but those promotions are kind of vague, right? So when you think of the word promotion, you think of someone who has a role gets promoted to a different role, perhaps with new and more important responsibilities, and perhaps with a little bit more salary. And what we learn in our survey is that's not the case at all. That a lot of uh, folks are just getting a secondary title for a job well done. They've been the program director for 10 years, they have no intention of replacing their program director, and they're simply going to give them another title, which is vice chair of education. Oh, by the way, probably not pay them any differently, to have that, right? So how many other vice chairs out there, particularly research and others, have two roles? Very few, right? Well, maybe one. Resnick just said he has one, there you go. But most, people, most of the other vice chairs have one role. And in education, that's not necessarily the case. And you see the predominant pathway to vice chair of education is through residency director, and a third of our respondents had those, uh, those were, uh, uh, dual roles. Um, others here, fellowship director, which I, th I think I can understand a med-ed fellowship being run by the vice chair. Uh, dual vice chair roles where they're distinctly different roles, um, perhaps with not two vice chair uh, salaries. And then certainly a smaller number of folks, but, but represented by Demetrius here, uh, have roles in the dean's office. So one of my questions that I'm going to hope our panelists will unravel here, is vice chair of education truly a promotion or is it a gold star for a job well done? And will the professionalization of this role end up becoming more of a true promotion for folks, that we're going to cleave residency director in particular away from vice chair of education and recognize that these two standalone roles um, have distinct roles and responsibilities within the department and the vice chair can support the program director because of that. Um, just a couple of other slides I think are interesting. In terms of training, all of our respondents held an MD or equivalent degree. Most were emergency medicine, but not all emergency medicine residency trained. Only a quarter were fellowship trained and um, of our total uh, respondent uh, respondent pool, only 6% had an education fellowship, which I thought was very interesting. So some fellowships included TOX and ultrasound and others. Um, very few have a master's degree in education, though you saw, you, you actually missed my introductory slide, everyone on this panel is in a program which they're about to get a degree, uh, two in master's degree and, and Demetrius getting a um, PhD. So no doctoral degrees, but one to come. So I think there are professionalization um, aspects that can come through formal training. And in terms of training, uh, only half of our respondents have had a certificate program in education. That's, I find, very interesting. Most of those folks went through the ASAP Teaching Fellowship, the Harvard Macy program, um, or Merck. And only half of our respondents have gone through a formal program of study in a leadership program. So, you know, I kind of imagine that most of the chairs have had leadership training. Having been a program director, I'll tell you, most of the program directors don't necessarily go through formal leadership programs. And somewhere in between that jump, is where folks are starting to acquire formal leadership training in some uh, form or fashion. In this case, most of our respondents talked about the SAM Chair Development Program uh, or the AAMC Leadership Programs. <clears throat> and when we, we get past the pathway to the role, what do the folks do in the role? This is not surprising to me at all. Uh, most of us have no job description for our day-to-day -day work, and most of us have no metrics to define our success. We're just sort of the inaugural vice chair. We're winging it. We're supporting people in the ways that we can support them. And that should change. Uh, radiology, when they did their study, um, 
uh, and published it in one of their journals, offered an Appendix A as a sample job description. We're planning to publish these findings as well. We have a manuscript just about done. We're going to be doing the same thing, offering a, a template roles and responsibilities for those who have not yet uh, developed the role. They can um, at least recruit somebody in with, with some sense of what are they going to do. Um, you wouldn't be surprised that if there's not a clear job description and not clear metrics of success, there's also very inconsistent support for the role. Some of us get quite a bit of buy down. Some of us get quite a bit of stipend. Some of us get administrative support. Others get nothing. So it's quite a wide variety. And, and really offering averages are, are um, not even worthwhile because it's just so all over the map. So with all of that, I have lots of questions. I hope you have lots of questions. I see some vice chairs of education in the audience. I see some other types of vice chairs. I see some folks who should be a vice chair in a couple of years. So hopefully we'll be um, asking those questions of our all-star panel. Uh, and I'm going to start just by asking them to introduce themselves and tell us a little bit about their path to vice chair. And we'll just we'll kind of go down the, the role with Dimitri here first. Great. Thank you, Mike, for that introduction. So um, again, my name is Dimitri Papadagnu. I'm the vice chair for education um, at Thomas Jefferson University, where I've held the role now for about four to five years. In the medical school, I'm also the associate dean for faculty development and faculty affairs. So my pathway has been rather circuitous and non-traditional. I have not been an APD or a PD. Shortly after finishing residency, I stepped into a clerkship director role. And at the time, I was asked to run the simulation program for the New York City Health and Hospitals Corporation. And that really got my interest going into pedagogy and how can we design curricula. And that's what prompted me to get advanced training in education and went to Columbia. And I'm now in the final stages of completing a doctorate in education. That sort of coincided with a move to TJU, where I was hired as the associate dean for faculty development. And about a year into that, there was a lot of kind of hubbub on campus about various departments hiring vice chairs for education. And my chair, um, who was a visionary in the back, Dr. Ted Christopher, um, sort of said, well, we should have one. And the person that's most qualified educationally is Dimitri. Didn't really have a job description. That's OK, Ted. Um, but you know, stepped into the role and tried to figure out for myself what were the needs and kind of can explain from there. Um, what my role and what my responsibilities transitioned into. So really, my background has been in simulation and understanding pedagogy and education from a doctoral program, which really emphasized coaching, organizational psychology, and adult learning. So not so much the educational trajectory and pathways and lessons learned from being a PD or a clerkship director for years, but a lot of concepts that are easily transferable to what we do in education on a day-to-day -day level in our respective programs. Ann? Okay. Hi. I'm Ann Messman. I'm at uh, Wayne State, and I'm the Vice Chair of Education there, obviously, and also the Medical Education Fellowship Director. Um, and we are finishing up our first year. Um, I created the fellowship, and I created the Vice Chair of Education role at my institution. Um, so my path was also a little bit unusual. Um, I am living proof that anyone can accomplish anything if they try really, really hard, because I was hired far more on potential than on prior accomplishments, um, in my opinion. So um, I stayed after I finished residency. I'm eight years out of residency, so arguably a little bit junior to be in this role. I've been vice chair for a year. Um, I stayed where I trained. I was in, can you guys hear me? Okay, um, barely? Okay, is this better? What the? Is this better? This is a lot better. Okay, so I stayed where I trained and um, became an APD there, and then we got bought by Team Health, and so I promptly left and uh, went over to Wayne State, where I am now. I work at Detroit Receiving in Sinai Grace um, as an APD, and um, I went from APD to vice chair, which is a little bit of a leap um, because there was a need and I was aggressive with the chair and wrote my own job description and said we need to do these things we're not doing any faculty development um, a lot of you guys probably have heard of Gloria Kuhn and she you know retired and so we had this huge void in our department of faculty development and um, medical education scholarship which is what I sort of focus on is medical education research and so I was able to convince my chair who I also think is, is visionary and um, a very supportive chair that this this role needed to be filled um, I am getting my master's right now. I was just promoted to associate professor. So he hired me 
pretty junior, you know, seven years out of residency, still an assistant professor and without my advanced training. Um, yes, I know, look at those wide eyes out there. But uh, that, so that's how I got to where, where I am now. Shall we try this or no? Yes, no? Okay. I'm loud, it's just a thing. Okay, uh, so uh, I'm the Vice Chair of Education, uh, the Residency Director, and the Director of the Medical Education Fellowship, which now makes me feel like I need to stop doing at least one of those things um, at Hopkins. Um, my path is, um, I started right out of residency as both the Clerkship Director and an APD at Bellevue. Um, and I ran the clerkship for three years and uh, was there as an APD for just under five. Um, and then I moved to Hopkins where I was an APD and then became the residency director and created a medical education fellowship and started both of those roles in 2010. Um, and along the course of the time um, in being the PD and working and helping others build themselves as educators, it became clear to me just that there were things that needed to happen in the department. And so I started to build faculty development programs and I started to help other people with their fellowships and build curricula for them. And at some point it sort of felt a little bit like um, maybe at some point in my career in the future, there would be a next step that didn't involve me just sort of doing things because I thought they needed to be done um, without anyone asking or without compensation or buyout or time. Um, and around that point, I'd say maybe five years ago, uh, I thought maybe a vice chair for education job might be where I would end up. Um, and that when I evaluated myself and who I thought that person should be, I realized that the area I felt the weakest was really in educational research. Um, and so I started my master's program going one class at a time uh, for a master's in education five years ago, and I'm actually graduating next week, yay. Um, and uh, then about three years ago, my chair, who I think is also visionary since you've all said it, and he is if you know him, um, I think realized at some point in, I don't know, five or 10 years, he may not be the chair anymore, and he really wanted there to be a great infrastructure around him um, for whomever took over next. And so he started developing vice chair roles across all of the other areas in our department in terms of clinical affairs, in terms of research. Um, we have a vice chair for system integration across all of our systems. Um, and we started having discussions about um, whether or not vice chair for education might be the right uh, position also to, to come up in our department. Um, and when he said, I think we should have one, I threw my hat in the ring because I felt like, hey, I'm already doing half of what I think the vice chair should do. Uh, and ultimately he agreed and um, I've been the vice chair of education for about two and a half, two and a half, three years. Um, and that's how I got where I am. Okay. Linda was on a panel um, about vice chairs in, in general, not vice chairs of education at the AACEM meeting in Puerto Rico just a couple of months ago. And the topic was, how many vice chairs is the right number of vice chairs? I wonder if you could just give like a, a very brief uh, review of how that discussion went down, since you have a chair who's obviously building a large vice chair team. Um, I think the, the panel, there were three of us. Um, most people uh, sounded like their systems have more than white, one vice chair, um, and that most places who have vice chairs represent the large domains that I think we all agree probably are the large domains in academic medicine, um, research, uh, education, um, usually something around either clinical affairs or you know, some version of the clinical operations piece. Um, a lot of places, in addition to those groupings, have like an executive vice chair who would be the person who sort of steps in were the chair to uh, not be able to fulfill their duties. Um, and some places it sounded like also had the feeling like all the vice chairs, if you're going to be appointed to a vice chair level, you should be someone that the chair could put in their place um, who you know, would hold that mission and be able to put the department's best foot forward. Um, one of our panelists sort of just took the opposing viewpoint and said one and that's it. Um, although he ultimately was like, I don't really think that, but I feel like I should be the contrarian <laughs> on the panel. Um, so most places seem like they have um, an equal representation of vice chairs across the various domains that seem to fall into academic medicine. Great. Um, you can certainly raise hands and ask questions as we go along. I have another question just about path uh, to, to this role. So um, for each of the panels, just a quick answer. Did you seek this role out? Was this uh, you know, when you were imagining my path in academic medicine, my next role, my next gig five years from now, what is that going to be? Were you thinking vice chair? And if you think beyond this role, and we should always be thinking about our next five to ten year move, do you think you're going to pivot to chair? I guess I'll go first. So when I started at Jefferson, I stepped into the associate dean for faculty development role. And I think when we think about what vice chairs for education do, 
I think faculty development, staff development, professional development is sort of an intrinsic description and task within that job description. So um, I was just essentially doing that, and I think, Linda, when you talk about the various vice chairs in the department, I think with the vice chair for education, one thing that I think that I need to do is really protect the educational missions among the several missions in the department, whether that's be clinical, developmental, um, research. So a lot of my time without the role was dedicated to sort of protecting the mission, the educational mission, and really advancing UME and the medical school. I think around 2014 when I started at Jefferson, our department had a very small footprint in the medical school and something that I was just charged to do vis-a-vis -vis the medical education fellowship, vis-a-vis -vis faculty development, vis-a-vis -vis hiring a new program director, vis-a-vis -vis hiring a new clerkship director was how do we strategically posit ourselves in the medical school to really make an impact and how do we secure resources from the medical school to help us advance our educational mission in the department. So that's something that I just started to do and it just happened to align with, really without thinking about what this role would turn into. So that was the Vice Chair for Education. So in answer to your question, no, it wasn't a position that I envisioned. It was one that just sort of fortuitously fell in my lap and it was aligned with what I was doing in the department. With regards to the second piece of your question, do I see myself stepping into a chair position and seeing this as a trajectory to a chair position? Um, I do not see myself as a chair. Um, given the work that I have been doing, I see myself more aligned to getting more involved in the medical school and I feel that my position as Vice Chair for Education allows me to champion more for my department and bolster more of my faculty in the medical school and get them on the front line and help their professional advancement. So I think there's an organic transition for me into medical school leadership. Interesting. Okay. Anne? Um, so as I said previously, um, yes, I, I pursued and created the Vice Chair of Education position at Wayne State. So the answer to the first part is absolutely. Sure. Um, and the second part about wanting to be a chair potentially, um, the honest answer is I don't know. Um, I, think, I think there's probably a 75% chance, but um, I don't know for sure. I don't, I don't know if I want to go more towards the medical school or, or stay w within the department. Uh, I will say, 50, 50, 50%, 50 I thought maybe I want to be a vice chair and maybe I should create something and advocate for myself. 50%, it just coincided with my chair wanting a bunch of vice chairs. Um, so at the same time, I had strategically made a decision to go back to school with the intent that maybe this would be a good job for me. So maybe it's 60, 40. Um, I don't know if I want to be a chair. Um, I've been exploring that uh, possibility in terms of what other skill sets would I need to develop, what would that look like in terms of me giving up a lot of the things that have been who I am as a as like a professional identity right you know as an educator as a mentor um, and I'll say that uh, one of the things I think that being vice chair has been actually really great for um, so I'm still obviously the program director I've been doing PD now for this is the end of my ninth year um, and I go home all the time thinking that I would never want to do another job and love it as much as I love being program director and the idea of having another job is actually terrifying to me that I would not really get the same um, value out of the development of the people that I love you know very much um, and I think that having this job has been really great because it's made me sit down and think about, um, I actually really enjoy mentoring my faculty. And I didn't do that really as a program director, but now that you all of a sudden have this title, they see you differently and they come to you with all sorts of different questions and needs for help. Um, and the same thing with the fellows and the fellowship directors. And it's, it's sort of opened my eyes a little bit that I think that the things that I love about my job are probably translatable to other types of jobs that have the same type of things I like to do. Um, and if you would ask me five years ago, do you want to be a chair? I would have said, absolutely not. It looks like the most miserable position ever known to man. Every, like they're busy, it's political disasters all the time. It's negotiations and reprimanding faculty, but that's all I do in my other jobs anyway. Um, so, really uh, yeah. you know, maybe. I think that it's nice sometimes to do something that's a little different because it allows you to think about the things about that job that that really reinforce what you enjoy. And I think being a chair, probably you can be the chair you want to be, right? So if you want to be a chair who focuses on mentorship and people development and you know, mission of your department, then I probably would need a great person for budgets because I'm never going to want to do that. So I think it's really understanding 
the fact that the role can be what you want it to be. And I think a lot of the vice chairs in education have made the role what they want it to be, which is why we, we're seeing the data that, that we have. Yeah, and just to sort of build on, I think that's a great point. Because there is no unified job description, it's very um, plastic. So it can really mold to what you want it to mold to. And I think because we have varied interests, it, it can essentially um, amplify what our expertise is in. So for some of us, it's mentorship. For some of us, it's advancing the GME mission. For some of us, it's amplifying scholarship in the department. For some of us, it's really bolstering our department in the medical school. And I think that's sort of what I hear when I hear our own narratives being shared. So I think that's something that might be true and a phenomenon that might be true at your respective institutions. No real do job description with a skill set that you know you have and it just gives you that vehicle to amplify that skill set. Yeah, you know, I think it's um, uh, an interesting observation that uh, perhaps the, games, the game has changed, right? We talked about this yesterday in a panel discussion. Dr. Williams brought this up, that the rules of the game when we were in residency 20 years ago, perhaps for most places, was the program director eventually went and jimmied for a chair job somewhere. Occasionally the research folks, without necessarily a title higher than research director, right? there wasn't really a vice chair of research, they took several of the chair jobs, but that was sort of the pathway options, right? And now we have this new world where the program directors and many other educators in your group could go to vice chair of education and from there, do they want to pivot to chair as they traditionally perhaps did 20 years ago, or do they pivot to the dean's office? And I think a lot of us are at this fork in the road. So we asked our uh, in our survey, who wants to be chair out of our 59 um, uh, or 47 respondents, and it was very few, it was 10% that wanted to, to go on to be a chair. Um, we had a small number of folks who wanted to pivot to something outside of academic medicine. Most folks wanted to stay in the role at least for another five years or go on to a dean's uh, position. Uh, Martin. Yeah, the of vice chair of oh, is this, can people hear me? <laughs> Um, I tend to be loud as well, so sorry. Um, with the proliferation of vice chair of colon, name whatever the vice chair is, sure. so education, clin ops, um, I happen to do clin ops. Um, that's great, and I think it represents the complexity that of, of the profession as we move forward. One of the failure modes that I potentially perceive is uh, potential siloism within the department, and it's something I struggle with a little bit. I mean, we have a great department, a very cohesive group of vice chairs in my department, but we do struggle about that, and how do we get in that? Um, and so I'm curious how you all handle that potential issue in your own departments. Um, so we have a monthly vice chair meeting with our chair, um, where all of the um, important domains are represented. And you know, any, any decision or any uh, issue, uh, everyone at the table has an opportunity to, one, either defend their mission or support a solution or a suggestion. Um, and I think it's, we just started it about a year ago, um, it's actually really changed the way that decisions are made in the department. And I think that some decisions which in the past had felt more uniformly representative of a certain domain or silo in our department, um, people just were unaware, right? Because everyone is operating and what's good for research and we'll just take that you know, resident lounge and, and change it because we need a refrigerator, right? And you're like, you can't do that. That's actually a requirement to have that. And I think having all the voices at the table where people can, um, you know, I use the verb defend, but it, it's not like an antagonistic conversation. It's really just, opening people's eyes to the importance of other people's perspectives and the, the various backgrounds sitting at the table have I think allowed not just people's stances to be protected um, in the pure sense of that but really a, a more collaborative better solution for almost all of the decisions that have been brought to the table. And just to build off of that I think when we talk about silos I think silos are more pervasive than we think within our educational mission our UME team was barely talking to the GME team, which was barely talking to those individuals that were responsible for faculty development. So one easy win was really breaking down those silos and creating an education division. And that edu education division, which really was led by the vice chair for education role, was able to speak and communicate with the other vice chairs at these leadership meetings to really explain what the overall mission is and how that changes and how that can be affected with clinical operations vis-a-vis -vis the vice chair for clinical operations or for research. And it just allowed a framework for us to really meld what the needs are. So great, we're rolling out this new clinical ops program. How is that going to affect our residents, our students? And you know, on the other side of the coin, now that we've done educational interventions that affect you and me, so one thing that we've done was really getting the EM clerkship from the fourth year of medical school into the third year of medical school, 
So we oftentimes hear how students wish that emergency medicine was exposed to them early on because it can really shape their career paths. It took a lot of fighting and being able to fight that role as a vice chair for education was helpful. But now that we've done that, it's important to have a higher level conversation as to what does that introduction of MS3s into the clinical learning environment look like. So I think breaking down those silos, but really breaking down those silos between the sort of intra-departmental missions. And I think that was a big problem that we had to overcome and get our UME people and GME people to start talking first. So two more, we'll go over here first. Yeah. Yeah, that was the perfect no, segue, that, thank you, to roles and responsibilities for the out. second half of this mm -hmm. panel. Um, um, job description that's coming you, know, you also verbalized almost our entire survey. He just an he asked like 12 <laughs> yeah. questions in a row. Yeah. 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 So thank you for that as well. So why don't we, why don't we run that? So how do you advance specific missions and what, what do you do on a day-to-day -day basis? And we'll maybe it's just a minute or two for each of those questions per, per person. Sure. Okay. So. Um, I think that uh, my department was unique in that we had a very strong classical research uh, leadership. Our chair, Brian O'Neill, is very involved in research. Phil Levy was our vice, is our vice chair of research. And we had no other vice chairs. Um, so to answer both that question and the prior one, um, the faculty basically fell into two camps. And one was, I do research with Phil Levy and Brian O'Neill, or I do nothing. And so I'm working a lot with the people that are doing nothing. Um, we had a problem where we have tons and tons of assistant professors that aren't even anywhere near getting promoted because they're kind of being um, ignored a little bit. Um, you know, the program directors and the clerkship directors, they, they aren't getting any particular attention because we were so heavily research focused, not med ed. Um, so I'm helping them get more scholarly produ productivity and learning that the interventions that they are doing can be studied and published and they can present. And so I'm, I'm helping the department get those folks some attention so that they can get promoted and get more in, involved in a scholarly way with the, the way that we're running our educational department because we have two large residency programs, over 300 medical students. Um, and so my job description is largely based on that, on overseeing the faculty um, in, a, in the, their medical education realm and um, doing research and also very mildly overseeing the residency programs and the clerkships, but they're fine. And uh, something that I think is interesting, I'd be curious what these two have to say, is um, my job description is very specific that I don't have the ability to fire. Um, and so that we made sure, the chair and I made sure to have that verbiage in there because if he doesn't give me that capability, then I don't want to be responsible for program directors failing at anything because I can't do anything about it. I don't really have a stick. And so that was very specifically worded into my job description. Um, so uh, I won't repeat what you've said. Um, I, I do work on trying to increase that scholarship specifically in our education division for our faculty. Um, I provide oversight for all of our educational programs, including the residency, which is easy. Um, but the medical student programs, our PA residency program, our fellowships, so to make sure that not only um, are we ensuring that we're meeting the mission of each of those individual programs, but that also that all of those programs have the resources and the manpower that they need to be effective in education. So in our department, I administrate an educational value unit system where every faculty owes a certain amount of time, incrementally more if they're educators, less if they're just core faculty, and slightly less if they're part-time faculty. Um, and I every year take that and disseminate all of everyone's hours across all of our programs to ensure that you know, the residency is not getting everybody good and the medical students are just getting what's left over, right? So to make sure that it's spread out, um, and then uh, faculty development. So every year we have uh, like a 12 part series choosing different topics every year. So last year we focused on re-upping our faculty procedural skills on less common procedures. The year before that it was all about bedside teaching and giving feedback. 
Um, this year we're deciding on what our core mission for faculty development is going to be. Um, and then evaluating faculty and getting feedback for them from medical students and from residents. And then I don't meet with all of them individually. Um, I meet with everyone in the education division individually and create goals for them for the year and metrics for how we'll measure that. But for all the other faculty, I give them, send them all their evaluation data and then I select 10% of the low performers and I meet with them individually and try to help move them forward because it would be impossible from a time perspective for me to meet with the 60 people. So we really target those who seem like they need help um, and I offer my time to anyone who wants to come and meet based on the data we've sent them but by and far most people if they're getting reasonable performance scores are happy just to say thanks I'll see you next year. So I think you've mentioned a lot of the points that I was going to make. I think one good thing that will come from our study is that we will be introducing a vice chair for education job description within emergency medicine. And I think that will kind of give us some clarity and some sort of consistency across um, our sites and geographically. Um, for me, it was really creating a culture for teaching and learning and a culture really that supported teaching and learning in the department. I think creating an education division was really important and break down that silo. Um, from, you know, just thinking about how we address things piece by piece, from UME, it was really to increase our cachet in the medical school. As you know, the medical, for those of you that are, that are in departments that are affiliated with the medical school, there is FTE support that comes down to the department for various faculty roles within the curriculum, and we weren't really receiving much back in 2014. But sort of wearing that hat that I had access to medical school needs and job descriptions that were available, whether it was CBL facilitation, phase one directors, um, transition to clerkship programs, I was able to bolster my faculty and push them forward. And most recently in our budgetary um, report, we were able to increase our funding for the medical school to $1.2 million in FTE support annually, which was pretty substantial. And I think one of the major vehicles for that and drivers for that was moving the clerkship early on and just getting emergency medicine more presence. Um, in terms of faculty, we do have an ERVU system, educational RVU system. Um, we're going to be publishing this soon, but if you want to take a look at that and look at that model, we were able to align this with, um, well, we're in the process of aligning this with a bonus structure and seeing how can that, that can further um, faculty involvement. And I think our medical education fellowship was something that was really instrumental. So we have a one or two year med ed fellowship and that is really the driver for a lot of the scholarship that happens and really helping faculty that want to be doing research that really just can't and do not have the bandwidth. So the fellows there are instrumental for that. So much so that they're interacting with other departments in the hospital and we even take fellows from other departments for short stints just to work on cross departmental collaboratives in medical education, one most recently being a patient safety escape room that we introduced for new intern orientation to get residents to learn how to report medical errors in our um, reporting system. So. So we're at about the 10 minute mark just in terms of uh, remarks. Um, next question, Dan. Yeah, I just, um, I commend you for doing the survey and, and getting this information out there because I, it's, we talked before about how many other articles have been written in other specialties. It is interesting, our vice chairs groups from other disciplines meets quarterly. So I meet with the vice chair of radiology, medicine, mm -hmm. there's about five or six. None of them are actually program directors. So they're all solely vice chairs. They may have a fellowship director role. But, uh, but I, was, I had a, one or two comments and I just wanted to ask you all a question. Uh, but one comment was uh, when I became a vice chair of education, like. About 10 or 11 years ago, my then chair started talking to me about it. But he really made me write down a job description. And I had to do that before I even stupidly even thought about what the support should be or whatever for mm -hmm. that. And so, um, but I'm wondering, my question for you all is, did you all have to come up with a description? You said that that wasn't all that common. And then was there a way that you got support for those duties or maybe some things on your plate that were there before offloaded so you can handle those new tasks? So, so, so that's one question. One other comment, though, I wanted to make was somebody mentioned about silos. I, I know that going to the chairs slash vice chairs meeting every year, two years ago, there were a couple presentations. I think it was, I think it was University of Texas, San Antonio and UIC had just started these comprehensive programs 
to try to reduce the silos in their mission areas. Mm -hmm. And it turns out that 60% or more of academic departments are doing just that. So I think the silo things, I don't, I think they existed long before these vice chair roles were created. So I think that's something that most chairs are cognizant of and trying to do more about just at that level. So you'll probably hear more about it. But I'm just curious about the job descriptions, if you had to submit those, and then how, what you did about support. Maybe one or two of you can respond. Yeah. Go ahead, Dimitri, you take your notes. Oh, okay, I was still formulating my thoughts. <laughs> um, great question, I think it's, it's one that will require a lot of unpacking, but I think um, one important goal and wish that we have for this study is to show that there is a dedicated description that would make it meritorious to untether from other jobs description. I think one of our hypotheses was that most vice chair for education would also hold the role of program director. And I think as we think about as advancing the vice chair role, and the jobs, the, the responsibilities need to be delineated that are distinct from program director. Um, any other comments? Matt? Sure. Uh, so yeah, I, I did write my own job description and that was absolutely required before the position was going to be created or, or given to anyone. Um, and I did that by, by researching what other job descriptions were out there in uh, Vice Chair of Education and Emergency Medicine. A couple of them uh, were published online that I was able to access. Um, something that helped for sure since I was going in with such a big ask, going from APD to Vice Chair, was uh, it, I timed it with receiving a decent sized grant so that I was able to fund myself a little bit. So that's certainly an option for some Vice Chairs of Education is to you know get a med ed research grant or whatever sort of grant to help fund your own position. That makes it a little easier when you're asking the chair for a big promotion or raise. So I, I also wrote my own. Um, I didn't initially get um, buy down or buy out time personally. What I did get was uh, another APD. So I said, you know, I'll keep both jobs, that's fine. Um, but I had three APDs and four classes of residence on a four-year program. I said I want a fourth one so that I can have someone in charge of each class, which will offload some of my work um, so that I can dedicate time over here. Um, and so we did that initially, and then I just went back and said, it's great, we're building and expanding, and he's very happy with all the programs. Um, I, need, I need actual buyout now. Uh, and I think doing the work and showing what that looked like in terms of my time commitment and the um, overburdensome time commitment that both of those roles had, it was a decision whether or not I was going to at that time give up the other job, which we both agreed he didn't want me to and I didn't want to, um, that we would then buy out some more of my time and that's coming from my clinical time uh, as opposed to my other administrative um, efforts. Um, but at the same time, it, it really takes also looking at everything you do, what's on your plate, and making a decision whether or not you want to keep it on your plate. Um, and ultimately, I also gave away other things I was planning and coordinating um, to other people in the department, some in my division and some not, um, just to try to have the ability to really focus on more higher level planning. Not so much um, included in our research and our survey, but anecdotally having conversations with other vice chairs for education, they typically hold a position for medical education fellowship director. So let it be known that I do not get any funding from my vice chair for education role. Um, however, I believe that there, there are models at specific, in, within specific departments where recruiting medical education fellows subsidizes vice chair for education time. Right, so if they're hired making a salary of X percent of what they would normally make for working those clinical shifts, a lot of that can be funneled through. I know a lot of ultrasound divisions have funneled their POCUS directors and their POCUS fellowship directors in that regard. And that has been a model that has kind of been, been there, but not have, it hasn't really been discussed too much. All right, with the four minute mark, there was a question back here too actually, right? You had a question as well? That's perfect. Awesome, great, that saved us time. Well, well thank you for uh, your, your insights. I, I found it very helpful. Um, but I, I see the, the majority of the speakers are from university-based programs. Mm -hmm. And given that the majority of EM programs are uh, community hospital-based, where this vice chair of education is even more nebulous, can you comment or I guess my suggestion or recommendation or need would be writing something 
that is also applicable to those positions, a vice chair of education in a community-based hospital where there is no direct medical school uh, interaction? Yeah, I, I'll answer that for the panel so that we can fit in another question. This was part of our study design. We felt that to be a vice chair, you had to be a department that had a chair. So you couldn't be a division. You couldn't be at a place that didn't have an academic department. Some academic departments are sponsored by community hospitals at, at certain medical schools, but it's the minority, right? So in our table one in our, in our pardon? But they don't necessarily have an academic department at a medical school that give you a chair, vice chair structure. So that, that actually changed who we could survey because we made that decision in our methods, as you'll see in our publication to come. Um, any final questions? Yes. Yeah. Hi, Tony Paul, University Hi, Tony. of Arkansas. Yeah. I'll be brief, but based on what I'm hearing, my question centers around the vagaries of FTE support for mm -hmm. the role itself. Um, I'm curious to know, based on the survey or maybe other information you have, what percentage of folks already had hard support because they either had a position in the dean's office, program director, grant funding, I know that's not necessarily hard money, um, aside from perhaps departmental support for the vice chair role. Okay. Um, yeah, so as I said, I, I was an APD, so I had a, a, you know, a set salary that um, got reviewed every year. Um, the timing with getting my grant was, was nice because I was going to have to renegotiate my contract anyways, and so we settled on a different number uh, when I got the, the new role, but it's, it's a specific number. You know, I get a specific salary for this job. I can actually work as many or as few shifts as I'd like. Um, you know, that's, that's just dependent on what income I would like to have. So, and, and I know for other people it's, you know, you get half of your clinical time bought down or it works differently at different places, but for me it was a specific salary. And I could read right out of our results section from our paper that um, the vice chairs generally receive a reduction in clinical duty, 77% of vice chairs did. The average reduction was 27% protected time um, uh, with an interquartile of 22.5. Some subjects received a salary stipend, 31%, um, and administrative support, 17%. Uh, yeah. So we're at time. Is there any final questions? We do have that. Yeah. That was in all the other papers. I don't think it was in your survey. So there, are, there, there were questions that actually asked the vice chair for education to, to identify what control they have over the budget, um, how the budget was allocated, and while we didn't present that data here, um, that will be reported in the manuscript. There was a question about do you receive administrative support as a vice chair, and if not, what kind of support do you receive? So that's reflected in the, in the manuscript as well. And 85% uh, of respondents control their departmental budget, and 57% are uh, generating an annual report. So we'll have that in there. Thank you all for your interest. Um, we'll answer your question afterwards just to be able to clear the stage. And we don't know who responded to our survey, but there are a lot of vice chairs of education in the audience. Thank you if you did respond. Uh, in helping us uh, with this paper. Thank you.